our next speaker is uh, Kurt Jacobs from the um, uh, Army Research Laboratory. And uh, he's going to be telling us about uh, it's a bit of a change of pace here. So we, we're going from um, superconducting qubits now to uh, room temperature um, optical qubits. And so um, he's going to tell us how you can use uh, <clears throat> second order nonlinearities to um, do quantum computation with uh, room temperature optical qubits. OK, Kurt, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation to, uh, to talk about this, uh, this work. So, uh, so the slide I'm starting off with here is, uh, is, is, the, uh, is the opening slide they, they like us to use, um, which has the Army Research Laboratory in large letters and the title rather smaller. So I, I usually provide a second, I usually like to provide, oops, a second slide, um, which I think is more reasonable. So here we are. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a photonic circuit uh, a design for a photonic circuit that uh, that will correct for photon loss, um, and um, in particular, it's going to be uh, it's going to be doing the processing uh, just using the chi two nonlinearity, and and the reason we want to use nonlinearities is uh, bulk nonlinearities is because it's one path to quantum computing at room temperature. Uh, so this is work that um, uh, that I did in collaboration with um, a number of people at. Uh, at MIT, um, Dirk England, Jeff Shapiro, uh, Michael Hoyt, and the, uh, the first author on the work is uh, Stefan Krastinov, who's a, a postdoc at MIT. Um, also Pranayan Arang, who's at, uh, at Harvard. Okay, so, uh, so I'm gonna give a little background uh, to start with. Um, so, so I already mentioned that, um, uh, that we'd like to pursue the possibility of doing quantum computing at, or doing quantum information processing, whether it be for networks or, or sensing, um, at room temperature. And you know, one, one reason for that is that um, uh, the uh, the army, uh, you know, is usually thinking about potential applications uh, in the field, which means things you can carry around. And you know, dilution refrigerators are not uh, are not lightweight, so. Um, so they, uh, they tend to view anything that requires cryogenic temperatures with a great deal of skepticism. Um, so, so that's one motivation. But, um, but in general, you know, if you could do things at room temperature, it would, it would make, um, it, you know, it would, it would tremendously lower the cost of, uh, of these technologies. So, uh, so that's the motivation. Um, and, uh, you know, the interesting thing about nonlinear optical crystals, the, uh, the nonlinear effect on the light uh, is due to the, the matter in the crystal, but it doesn't come with, or it doesn't appear at this point, uh, to come with much noise, even though the matter is at room temperature and, you know, fluctuating all over the place. Um, the, uh, you know, presumably this has quite a lot to do with the, um, you know, the fact that the light has frequencies that are very high compared to, to, to room temperatures. But, um, but anyway, so that's, uh, that's the motivation for, uh, for trying to do computing with, with optical nonlinearities. Now, uh, while it's been known for many years that you, know, you potentially uh, do quantum information processing with, uh, with nonlinear optical crystals, um, it's never looked very promising. And so, you know, some work's been done on it, but uh, not a great deal compared to other platforms. And uh, so, so the reason it hasn't looked very promising is that uh, the nonlinearity is very weak compared to the amount of time that you can hold a photon uh, sitting around in an optical cavity. And uh, so um, in the last few years, so I'm just going to talk about that a little bit now. Um, in the last decade or so, there's been a fair amount of progress in, in the various things you require to, to do information processing with bulk nonlinearities. So you know, one of those things is that the, uh, well, was actually the, uh, the discovery in 2011 by, um, uh, by Langford, uh, Langford et al. It was, uh, I think, Jared Milburn and uh, um, Anton Zeilinger were also um, involved in that. Um, the, uh, they discovered that 
rather than um, using chi-3 nonlinearities, which is a higher order nonlinearity than a chi-2, rather than using chi-3s, it, it's always been obvious you could use chi-3 to do uh, quantum computing, but it wasn't so obvious you could use chi-2 nonlinearities. Um, the, uh, the kind of dynamics you get out of a chi-2 just doesn't lend itself obviously to doing computing and people were never really sure about it, but, uh, but they found, uh, Langford et al found a simple way to do it. So it became obvious you could use chi-2. Now, because chi-2 is a lower order nonlinearity, it's stronger. Uh, so, that's, so that's an advantage to start with. Secondly, um, in the last decade, new materials have been developed that have considerably stronger chi-2 nonlinearities than previously. Um, one of those in particular is um, lithium niobate, uh, but uh, I think gallium arsenide um, uh, is another one. Uh, and there's also been a lot of progress in, uh, in uh, building uh, cavities that are better and better, uh, cavities on, um, uh, fabricated on photonic crystals that are uh, better and better at confining photons. So there's been quite a lot of improvement there. Uh, so, so you see over on the left-hand side, I've got some plots. Uh, so the, the, the first plot here is uh, the Q factor, that is essentially the, uh, um, how, how, well, how, how long you can confine a, a photon in a, in a cavity for. Um, that's been, uh, over the last decade, that's been increasing. And if you look at that plot, and it seems to be increasing more or less as a straight line, which means that it's increasing exponentially because it's a log, uh, a logarithm on the uh, on the Q factor ax axis. Um, so if that continues, um, then we expect a lot more improvement. However, there there, there is a bit of a uh, it's a bit of a catch to that, and that is that um, there are really two things you need from your cavity in order to do uh, computing with with bulk nonlinearities. And one of them is that you need to keep your photon hanging around for a while. But the other is that you need to, uh, to have the photon as tightly confined as possible. So you need the cavity to be very small. And the reason for that is that the more tightly you confine your photon, the, uh, the stronger the electric field, because you, you're getting the energy of that photon, you're packing it into a tighter space. You, you therefore have to have a higher electric field to, um, to be supporting that energy or to, to to give you that energy. And um, the stronger the electric field, uh, the stronger the effect of the nonlinearity on the photon. Um, so what you really want is you want high Q cavities that are also very tightly confined. And so this plot here uh, is a little deceptive in that these, uh, as the Q factors go up, um, the confinement may actually be going down a bit. Um, so uh, so we'll, we'll look at that anyway. We'll look at the, um, uh, the combined effect of, um, of trying to get smaller cavities and better cavities. Um, and uh, the second plot down here is something called the efficiency. That's for um, second harmonic generation using a chi-2. And that, that efficiency folds in the volume of the cavity on the bottom there and um, the Q factor and also the strength of the chi-2 medium. And we see that that has actually been going up also exponentially. So that's, that's much more promising. Um, but, but we'll return to that a little later. So, uh, so we know that you can use chi-2 nonlinearities. Certainly there's been considerable progress in developing better cavities. Uh, and um, something that's particularly interesting um, in I think it was uh, 2016 to 2018, um, there were two groups who realized uh, a way to confine photons much more tightly than previously. And so I have uh, this, uh, this graphic up here, the one that's, that's yellow, red, and black on the uh, right-hand side entitled ultra-confining cavities. So we have, um, we have two, two cavity shapes here, a, uh, a circle and a square. And what they discovered was that if you um, if you put a, another medium uh, in the center, so you cut the cavity in half, something of a different refractive index, you cut it in half, and then you take that piece, you cut it in half again, and then you take that and you cut that in half again, et cetera, et cetera, on this progression that goes along to the right here, you, you have this fractal-like structure, if you like, 
going down into the center of the cavity, forming this very small structure in the center of the cavity, then uh, what happens, which you can see from these pictures, the, the electric field here, uh, the stronger the electric field, the lighter the picture. So the yellow is telling you where the, where the field is confined. And we see that um, uh, on the left, when we don't have the structure in the center of the cavity, uh, the field is, um, is dispersed all over the cavity. But, um, but when we move to the right-hand side of this tiny structure, we see the field is very tightly confined in the middle. And that's, um, so that is a uh, certainly a significant advance in moving towards uh, doing, uh, doing computing with bulk nonlinearities. However, we don't just need tightly confining cavities. We also have to, those have to be high quality cavities. And you know these initial designs are not high high quality, so so we need improvement. Uh, we need designs to to take us in both those directions. Um, and finally, it was thought for uh, for a few years recently. Um, well, the, the first this first paper came out um, going down to the bottom of the slide here. Uh, bulk nonlinearities, it turns out, to store wave packets, and um, Jeff Shapiro was the first person to point this out. And uh, Jeb Anna Klosh um, also uh, also uh, had um, an analysis of this in 2010, and they pointed out that you know if you if you had a wave packet, and uh, let's say you have you know two wave packets each containing a photon, you want to do a nonlinear gate between them, um, then uh, you 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 can do the gate. The nonlinearity will do the operation on the photons. But at the same time, it's just stored in the wave packets, and that's going to, you know, completely mess with your ability to, uh, to process quantum information because, you know, if the shape of your wave packet depends on the, uh, you know, the state of the photon, um, then you're well, you're basically entangling your quantum information with an, another degree of freedom, and uh, if you want to be operating on these wave packets. Uh, you need to know what they are. You, you can't have them um, changing their shape, essentially, at random as you're trying to do the computation. So uh, th there was a feeling that this might really stop you being able to use uh, bulk nonlinearities to do computing. Um, so, uh, so I recently um, wrote a paper with Dirk England and Nicole Hulick in which we showed that, um, that in fact, uh, uh, you know, it, it was okay. You, you could still do um, your gates uh, with optical nonlinearities, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, um, which which also provides a little bit of background for what we're going to go on to, which is uh, now we we have our gates. How are we going to um, to correct for photon loss, which is the, uh, the the biggest source of errors in an optical platform. So we'll move over to the next slide. By the way, uh, I forgot to mention this, but I'm um, very happy uh, for people to interrupt any time they want to clarify something, ask a question. Um, I will I will check out the chat as well um, to see whether uh, there are any questions um, uh, in the uh, in the chat. Let's see. Okay, I've managed to. Uh, Don't, I don't think there's any. Yes, are there? Oh, uh, it looks like there might be a question or two here. Uh, um, right. So, how do you I, use Haiku in your second uh, process? Do you use second harmonic generation, optical parametric oscillators? What exactly do you use to do these? Right. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I will get onto that um, and some more uh, some more details. Um, it, it, it really it really depends, actually. You uh, there's there's quite a lot of flexibility. So, um, I think, uh, as I recall, in the uh, in the gates that we um, in the gates that I've been considering, uh, we're using. Um, uh, well, we're using the process. Uh, well, the, the basic Chi two process, right? Converts. Uh, it, it involves three. It involves three photons. Um, but uh, so 
we're both using a process where each of those photons may have different frequencies. So we take um, a photon at one frequency, a photon at another frequency, and convert that to, uh, to, to a, a frequency which is the sum of the two. Um, uh, but um, often we'll be doing the, uh, the second harmonic generation type um, where you have two of the same frequency and you're creating a photon at double the frequency. But, but, but we're using that in both the up conversion and in the, um, I think the OPO, right, which is, um, uh, which is down conversion. Um, but, uh, but we don't, we don't really, it's not so much that we're um, doing one or the other, it's just that uh, we're using the interaction w which can do either, but we're using it to form a gate. But, but I will go into that in more detail. Uh, what exactly is a Q factor? Right, yes, well, the Q factor is um, the, uh, the frequency of the cavity divided by uh, the lost rate of the cavity. So, uh, so a higher Q factor means that you have a, uh, a lower loss rate compared to the frequency. So if you fix the frequency, then higher Q factor means that the loss rate is going down and therefore you can store a photon for longer. All right, um, so, uh, so now I'm gonna talk about uh, how we, you know, the, the basic process of, of performing gates. Uh, so if I have a, um, uh, a photon, say, say a, uh, uh, a qubit, which, which might be uh, a mode that has either a photon or no photon, um, or it might be uh, what's called a dual rail qubit, where you have two modes and the photon is either in one of the modes or in the other mode. Um, uh, one way or the other, you have a mode and it has either a photon or no photon in it. And we have two such modes and we wish to perform a logic gate between them, uh, like a C naught or a C phase gate or something like that. Um, so uh, what, we, what we want to do is we want to take those traveling wave photons and load them into a cavity, um, perform the gate in the cavity and then uh, send them back on their way. Um, and uh, so the, the issue with the nonlinearity is that you know, if you have, if your cavity has a nonlinear medium, then as you load the photon in, um, and, and, and as you then let the photon leak out, the fact that there's a nonlinearity in there is going to change, is going to affect the shape of the, um, of the wave packet in general. And, uh, and that, the way it affects the shape will depend on how many photons you have in, in the cavity. And so that's, that's the, the, the issue there. Um, so, so first of all, I'm going to explain how you can use a Chi-2 nonlinearity um, as the mechanism of loading a wave packet into a cavity. So, uh, so it's quite neat. Um, what you uh, what you do? Uh, I've written I've written here in the top right hand corner uh, a. Uh, sort of an equation, doesn't have an equal sign in it, but a set of symbols, right? Um, the chi-2 nonlinearity has a term in the Hamiltonian, which is lambda is some number, giving you the overall rate at which the interaction happens, a b dagger c dagger. So here we have three modes represented by annihilation operators a, b, c. And this particular term is annihilating a photon of mode a and creating photons of mode b and c. And of course, in the Hamiltonian, you'll also have the emission conjugate of this, which is doing the reverse. It's destroying photons of C and B and creating a photon of mode A. So you can think of a chi-2 nonlinearity as being a conversion process. It always involves three modes. That's why it's called chi-2, because it involves three modes. Uh, chi-3 involves four modes, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so, so here's one thing you can do with a chi-2, and that is that um, I can... I can take my C mode and I can uh, uh, prepare that in a coherent state, um, a coherent state that has many, many photons, say a few million, a few billion, something along those lines. And if you do that, then um, under the right circumstances, but generally, uh, it's true that 
um, the processes that occur will then um, will then essentially not change the state of the um, uh, will not change that coherent state, uh, not appreciably. Um, what that means is that the coherent state actually remains disentangled and uncorrelated with the other two modes. Um, and uh, you know, one of the conditions is that those other modes are not pouring many, many photons into the coherent state. But if those other, if those other modes just have a couple of photons in them, then that's fine. Um, so you can show this fairly rigorously, I won't, I won't try now, but essentially that means that you can replace one of your modes with a classical number that you can control. So what are you left with when you do that? Well, what you're left with is now just a linear interaction between modes A and B, just a, uh, a standard linear uh, coupling between those modes in the rotating wave approximation, which is, uh, once again, just a conversion of photons between the modes, uh, which is now controllable because you can, uh, by changing the coherent state in your C mode, you, you can now uh, turn off and on that coupler. So this is, this is a very handy, handy thing to be able to do. It means you can have two modes uh, in a nonlinear material that, uh, that overlap. And then, uh, and then you can um, uh, just uh, control the coupling at will. You can uh, take a photon in one, swap it to the other one, etc. Now it turns out that this process um, is actually a good way to load photons into a cavity. And I'm going to, so I'll see if I can explain that now. Um, so this, uh, this diagram on the left here has this cross shape. So um, the four arms of the cross have these holes drilled in them in, in, in what's called a photonic crystal. So it's a photonic material with, uh, with holes drilled in periodically. And so that forms a crystal structure, if you like, a periodic structure. And those holes, uh, if they have the right, si right size and the right spacing, will be extremely good mirrors for light. So, so we now have uh, mirrors on the on the two arms, and the um, uh, and that means that uh, that we have uh, two cavities uh, formed at the center. So light's trapped in the center. Um, one cavity is going one way, and one cavity is going the other way, and the, the two cavities are crossing each other. So I, I can store one mode in one. So I look at the center. Uh, this, so I have a cross at the top and then one in the center and then one down, um, one, one below. So if you look at the center one, I've drawn uh, two modes in here, which are crossing each other. So I've got my two photons that overlap. Now, um, it's, it's been known for a long time that you can, uh, that you can get a, uh, a traveling wave photo in a waveguide. If you have a cavity coupled to it, then if you can... Uh, control the coupling between the cavity and the waveguide in the right way, so basically just give it the right profile in time that uh, that matches uh, that matches in the right way the profile of the the envelope of the photon, so the waveform of the photon that's coming along. Then the cavity uh, can suck up the entire photon and and store the uh, store the photon in the cavity. So that's been known for. Uh, for quite a while. Um, I think the, uh, the first paper uh, explicitly on that was, um, was by uh, Peter Zola, Ignacio Serac, and Hidama Bucci back in about 1999. Um, so they, they showed that process. Um, they, they did it with an atom in the cavity and they were actually coupling the, um, changing the coupling of the cavity to the atom. Um, anyway, so what we can do here is we can use the same kind of process. So if you, if you go over to the right-hand side, I'm sorry, if you go over to the right-hand side where I have um, this drawing with the purple ovals, then on the left, I've got this thing called um, this, this vertical line, which is called a bus waveguide. So I imagine a photon traveling along this line, and then that line touches one of the ovals, which is, which is a, a ring cavity. And um, so, what I can do is I can use my chi two nonlinearity to turn off and on the coupling between uh, this first ring, which is coupled to the waveguide, and a second cavity, which has a much much smaller coupling. So it's very to the waveguide. It's a to a waveguide. It's a very um, uh, uh, it's a good cavity. So 
so it has a low, um, uh, has a high Q factor. Um, what I can do is I can use the chi two nonlinearity to control to turn off and on a coupling from the first cavity to the second cavity, and that is enough of a degree of freedom so that if I have a wave packet, um, uh, so if I have a wave packet coming along in the uh, along the bus waveguide, and um, and then impinging on the first cavity by controlling the coupling between the two cavities in the right way to match the particular profile of the photon, um, you can actually get the second cavity to suck up the entire photon and, um, and store that in the second cavity. So that's a way to use a chi-2 medium, to use the fact that a chi-2 medium has a controllable coupling between two cavities to, um, uh, to load and then unload photon from a cavity. So um, just to give a little more insight into that, uh, one way to design that coupling is that uh, you can imagine that what you want to do is I've got my photon coming in and impinging on the cavity. So some of the photon is leaking into the cavity. But then as the photon comes into the cavity, also it's going to start leaking out of the cavity, cavity immediately as well. So, so the output from the cavity, when the photon is coming into the cavity, the output from the cavity is actually the sum of what's coming out of the cavity and the part of the photon that's reflecting off the cavity and going along the waveguide. So what you want to do is you want to control the coupling between that cavity and the second cavity so that whatever is in the cavity, the first cavity at any given time, will whatever leaks out from that will exactly cancel the field which is being reflected um, from that cavity. And so if you can get a complete cancellation of the reflection of the photon off the first cavity, then all the photon is going into the cavity. So anyway. I, I have a question. Yes. Why is it 737 and not 775? Uh, um, Okay, right. Let me just, I've just gone and messed up my slides. Right, okay. So um, you're, I think what you're doing is, is you're dividing 1550 by two. Um, That's correct. Well, yeah. Okay, so this, this particular picture is not, is not really uh, designed um, for the explanation I was giving. Uh, so I, I guess it was actually a bit foolish of me to leave those in. Um, so, uh, so in this particular case, um, uh, this was designed actually to have two modes. I believe this is uh, this is this particular design to have two modes in the second cavity. Um, one of which is strongly output coupled, and one of which is not. And both those modes are at seven thirty seven. I think. Um, actually, hang on. Is that? Uh, no, actually, if they're both at seven thirty seven, um, they'd have to be both out. Okay, so maybe that's. Um, so maybe they have one at 737 and they have one, they have another one um, that's at a different frequency. And, um, and then the, the 1500 was, um, uh, was to couple uh, both of those, what was the, um, was going to be the sum of those two. So, so I think probably um, what's happening there is that they, they actually have two frequencies in that cavity. Each of them are a bit different and they sum to 1550. So that's why that number is not one so half. You have, a third, you have a third frequency running around to balance the 1500, is that it? Um, yeah, there's a, I, I, I think there's actually a third frequency that's also trapped in that second frequency, but they, in that second, yeah, but they haven't written it down. Um, I, I think that's what's going on there. Um, so, so in fact, um, the 1550 in that first cavity is actually going to be a classical coherent field, and that's going to control the coupling between the two modes in the second cavity. I think that's how they plan to use that. But, um, but, but there'd be different ways of using it, right? Because you can, um, depending on how the frequencies and phases are matched up, you could, you could do with different processes. Um, but yes, quite. Uh, that, is, uh, that is not matched up exactly with what I was saying. So um, anyway, so, so there we have a way to, um, to uh, load and unload 
from the cavity. Now, because there, there's, non, there's non linearities in the cavity, this could still be a potential problem for wave packet distortion. So what one finds that is that if you if you allow a slow, a relatively uh, a very, if you have a very fast absorption, so you have a, a tight wave packet which gets absorbed very quickly, compared to the time it takes to do your nonlinear gate in the cavity, which I haven't got to yet, then then your distortion is actually very small, and you can work in a regime where the distortion is not going to be significant. But but there's also another way to actually get um, a gate to work that has um, actually no distortion. And that is that because you can turn on and off the couplings between your cavities, you could potentially have um, a cavity that doesn't have any nonlinearity. And then next to it, a cavity that does have a nonlinearity and, um, and swap your photon from one cavity to the other to get your gate and then swap it back. And you wouldn't be getting wave packet distortion because everything's in the cavity. Now, that is actually... Um, uh, experimentally a lot harder to achieve though because then you have to have different materials on your fabrication and ideally you'd like to use one crystal so it's a theoretical possibility but um, that, that may be more difficult to achieve so I haven't yet talked about the way you actually you know implement a gate using a non-linearities um, so uh, there are ways to do that um, that are uh, that are fairly um, that, that are fairly simple to understand. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, go on and show you how we, uh, how we actually implement using quantum control um, a more uh, flexible set of gates using a chi two. Um, so anyway, so, so we'll, we'll do that here and then I, I can go back and, and explain um, the original ideas for it if, uh, if you want to. Um, so here we are. We've, we've um, shown that uh, room temperature operation um, uh, could potentially be possible using bulk nonlinearities. That technology is not at the point where it can be done now, um, but there has been a lot of progress in the last 10 years. And from that progress, we estimate, if you extrapolate that on, we estimate that in about another 10 years, we will have, um, we'll have the... Uh, the, the ability to demonstrate a nonlinear gate. Um, so it's still a little while off, um, and, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more details about that extrapolation at the end of the talk. Um, so now we have a basis for implementing our gates. We load our photons into cavities that are nonlinear, and then we can perform nonlinear operations in the cavities. Uh, so so now we're going to go on and say, well, now we know that we can do these gates. Uh, let's see if we can do the first thing that we really want to be able to do, and that is to correct for photon loss. Now, you could consider a standard method for doing this, which is that you simply have uh, each mode um, uh, contains one or zero photons. And so uh, you have uh, a qubit, each mode defines either a single qubit or maybe two modes to find a, a dual rail qubit. And, um, uh, and then you apply uh, your, your, your standard qubit gates to uh, do your encoding and do your error correction. Um, so to correct for photon loss, because photon loss is you know, neither a bit flip nor a phase flip, uh, you actually have to have a full error correction code to do it. So the smallest qubit code is the five qubit code. And uh, so that would require say 10 modes for a uh, dual rail qubit, uh, uh, for dual rail um, encoding. Um, and then you have to have you know, a fairly large number of CNOT gates um, in order to do the decoding. And especially if you want to do it in a um, fault tolerant way, then, then you have even, um, even more uh, gates required. So you really end up with um, you know, really rather large circuits to do that. Um, so what we wanted to look at was, you know, let's let's use a bosonic code that that only requires you know one or two modes, and see uh, and see how we can uh, maybe use the uh, the chi two nonlinearity 
a bit more efficiently to perform the kinds of operations we need to do error correction. Now, the kinds of operations we need are not so well defined now. And we're no longer talking about a qubit space because we're going to have a few photons in each mode. And if I just apply a chi 2 nonlinearity to a few photons in each mode, uh, the space is going to get bigger. I mean, I'm going to do up conversion or down conversion, and I'll have um, different numbers of photons in the modes. Uh, so, you know, it's not so obvious how you break down your circuits into basic elements and what they should be. Um, thirdly, we wanted to do it all unitarily so we didn't have to mess around with, with measurements. It's always seemed to me that, you know, the addition of measurements creates an additional technological overhead. It would be nice, ideally, to do everything on, you know, with your, with your basic unitary circuit without having to um, have these classical feedback loops in it. So, so, so this, is what we, uh, this is what we had a look at to see what we could do. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to tell you about the bosonic code that we decided to use. So the nice thing is that you've already um, uh, heard a talk that has described uh, three ways to encode qubits in modes. And uh, so we're going to, we're going to use these uh, bosonic codes that are written in terms of number states of qubits, uh, low numbers of qubits. And um, the, reason, uh, the reason we did that is because, you know, codes have been developed just specifically for photon loss correction. Uh, so they won't, it's, it's not a full error correction. It won't, it won't necessarily fix phase errors on your, uh, uh, on your modes, but, uh, but loss is, is a much bigger source of error. So the first thing you want to do is correct the photon loss. So the particular bosonic code, um, one, one, it was one of the first that was suggested, and I, I think this was by Ike Chuang and collaborators like quite a long time ago in the 90s at some point. Uh, you know, they pointed out that if you take this two, these two mode states, where our logical one is going to have two photons in each mode, and my zero state is going to be a superposition of four photons in one mode and four photons in another, then uh, this allows you to correct against photon loss. Um, so the first thing you have to ensure when you are, when you're trying to create a code against photon loss is that the rate at which photons will be lost, so the probability of losing a photon, depends on how many photons there are in the mode. And this is a potential problem because if I have one logical state that has six photons in it and my other logical state has two photons in it, then those two logical states will be, will be decaying, will, will be spitting out photons at different rates. And what that means is that when you detect a photon, you now have information about which of the logical states it's in. So the first thing you have to ensure is that your code states have the same rate of photon loss. So here, this is done, uh, the same average rate of photon loss. So here, this is um, done in a particularly simple way. We have, uh, each of these states has, has four photons in it. Um, each of the number states uh, used has four photons. And so if we look at the decay probability, which is, which is simply um, applying the number operator for the first mode, A dagger A, plus the number operator for the second mode, B dagger B, we look at that, and in both cases, we get four, and so they have the same, um, the same rate of photon loss. Um, and uh, so, that's, so that's a start. And then we have to ensure that the error states, of course, don't overlap with any of the code states or each other, so we can correct, so we don't lose information. And so we look, we look down the error states here. The error states are what happens whenever you take a photon away from one of these modes. And we have four error states, one, two, two, one, three, zero, and zero, three. Uh, so note that when we lose a photon from the zero logical state, one of um, the number states in the superposition immediately vanishes because it has no photons in one mode, and therefore that mode cannot have lost a photon. Uh, uh, and therefore that state cannot have been present. Um, anyway, so, so this is the... Um, this is the code we're going to use. Um, right. So, oh, hang on. I'm uh, having difficulty. There we go. So, 
So we decided that um, we would uh, we would try to uh, we, we would start with a system that had three modes in it. So we start with a single cavity. I've drawn um, some of the diamatic, dia, diagrammatic uh, depiction of this on the left hand in the left hand top corner. And so the idea is that it's a cavity that supports three modes. You know, it's it's fairly challenging to create photonic cavities that support three modes, but once we have a three mode cavity, then uh, this allows us uh, some uh, some flexibility in well at least it, it allows us you know more than one process that's going on between these modes. The idea is that um, if we have our chi two nonlinearities here and we have some degrees of freedom to control, then we may be able to get this single element to perform more than one kind of gate by, uh, by doing some kind of time dependent control. So, so what, what we're going to do here is to set up the frequencies of the three modes so that we will have a, um, a uh, second harmonic generation or alternatively parametric down conversion interaction between modes A and B. So I've written that at the top here, um, A B dagger squared. So A will have twice the frequency of B. Two photons of B will be converted to one photon of A. So that's going to be our, our non-linear element. Now between modes C and B, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce actually a fourth, a fourth, um, a fourth mode, which, well, it, yeah, it, it may need to be supported. May, may, maybe it's a mode in a different cavity that overlaps with the others, but it's going to be in a coherent state. So. Um, Potentially, it might not need a cavity because it could be an electric field at gigahertz frequencies, which is which is simply providing the frequency difference between B and C. Um, but anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to use this chi two nonlinearity with a strong coherent field to create a controllable coupling between B and C. So that's our Hamiltonian. I've written the Hamiltonian down here. We have our fixed chi two nonlinearity, which is a nonlinear element which is coupling A and B. And then we have our controllable linear coupling between B and C. And so the hope was that, uh, that just by doing the linear control, the, the control of the linear coupling, that that may give us enough degrees of freedom with the fixed nonlinear element to perform, uh, to perform a number of different gates and hopefully enough to do our error correction. So it turned out that that was the case. Um, now, we are adding this additional complexity, which is you know, the ability to do this time dependent control. And the real question is, uh, if, if I have my nonlinearity with strength lambda, that is giving me my basic speed of my operations. So what we want is that when we're creating these, these more complex gates, between our three modes using that nonlinearity, that the whole control process to get a gate doesn't take too many time cycles of this lambda. So in other words, not, not too many uh, inverse, inverse lambdas, right? So, so if I have my, uh, my rate as lambda, then the time it takes to, uh, to flip a photon, do a photon conversion between A and B is, uh, what is it, it's pi over lambda, I think. Um, doesn't doesn't take too much longer. So what we found, and here are control sequences that um, that we've explicitly found for our linear coupling um, uh, to do various gates. Uh, these um, the, the the time on the bottom line is in is in inverse lambdas. So we see that these gates take about uh, seven inverse lambdas. So we lose a factor of seven in speed between our basic chi two nonlinearity and um, uh, and the gates themselves. What we gain is that our gates are 
fairly complex. So they're doing, you know, they're doing more than a C naught does. Um, so I'm going to, so I've got ex three examples of games that we can implement um, by uh, by loading our uh, by loading our photons into one or more of these modes and then performing this time dependent control operation. So, um, so I've got, I've, I've written three down here. One's conditional transfer. And uh, so the uh, conditional transfer, we mean that we're going to take photons from one mode and put them in the other, but only if the third mode has a photon in it. Actually, uh, it's the other way around here. We're going to do it only if it doesn't have a photon in it. We're going to do the transfer. If it has a photon in it, we're going to leave those modes alone. Um, and so that's the mapping I've written below. Um, so, so we're starting with no photons in the A mode. We're starting with zero, two or four photons in the B mode. And what we want to do is to uh, transfer those photons to the A mode. Remember that we're doing up conversion. So two B photons only goes to one A photon. So um, what happens if we have no photons in our C mode then we want our four photons to transfer to two photons in the A mode. And similarly, two photons to transfer to one photon. So, that, so that's a conditional transfer. Um, we can do a conditional add, which is taking, um, uh, taking a photon in mode uh, C and adding it to the number of photons in mode B. So that's something that is very useful for us to do if we're trying to do photon loss correction because we've lost a photon, so somehow we have to get another photon in, right? So we have to supply a photon and have that photon added to our state. Um, and then finally, uh, there's another operation that we needed, um, which actually just involves two modes, um, once again. And um, this is to do a entangling or symmetrizing operation. Uh, so if our, if our photons have the same, the same number of photons, one each, then we don't do anything. But if one has two and one has zero, then we create this symmetric superposition. And the reason for that, if we go back to our code, is that when we lose a photon from the zero logical state, we start in the superposition of number states, but we end up uh, we end up going just to a number state because one of those states is, is annihilated in the, uh, in the photon loss. So we had to have something to do that. Anyway, so, so it turns out that this three mode system is, is pretty flexible, um, which, is, uh, you know, which is good, it's, it's an advantage. Uh, so, so what we came up with, um, I, should, I should check I should check time. Uh, let me just see if I can find the time here. Uh, it's 12.19. Okay, so officially we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, now let me get back to this. Um, okay, so, so we came up with the following circuit. Um, in fact, this, this was made mainly uh, Stefan Krastinov was the one who uh, who, you know, had this idea of trying to then, uh, we, ha we have these, this flexible cavity that can do these things, but let's see how many, let's see if we can use the cavities more than once, so we don't need very many of them. And so, um, so we've got a circuit here that just has two of these cavities, which I've called 3MP, three mode processor. And um, so, uh, so we have two of them, and then we have a bunch of uh, transmission lines or waveguides here, which are which are just for routing photon wave packets between the uh, between the modes of those processors. So the diamonds on the left hand side are uh, are the inputs and outputs. So we have so our two mode code comes in, our encoded logical qubit comes in. Uh, one in the top diamond and one in the bottom diamond. And then the little square boxes with the squiggly lines inside them. Uh, the idea is that's a switch that you can turn off and on. So um, in other words, a beam splitter that you can get to uh, so that when your photons come in, they will either 
swap between the two waveguides or they won't swap. Uh, so that's our, a, bill, a conditional routing. Um, one way to do that is to have uh, the structure in there be a Mark Zender interferometer and to have a, um, to have a uh, refractive index in there in the Mark Zender interferometer that, um, that is controllable, maybe electrically controllable. And uh, so what a Mark Zender interferometer does, right, depending on the phase shift, is that, you know, one of the outputs will be dark and one will be bright, uh, depending on what the phase shift is. And then change the phase shift and you can swap it around so the photon will come out the other side. So that's, um, that's one way to implement those. Uh, so anyway, so, so what happens here is that, uh, is that we have this, this en enough, enough flexibility in the routing to get our photons into our three MPs and then between the three MPs, take them out of one and put them in the other. Um, and then we have on the right hand side, we have these coils, which are just meant to be delay lines. In other words, we may have some photons in a mode and we want to, and we don't want it to be in a 3MP for the next cycle. We don't want to do a process on it. We just want it to sit there and not interfere with anything else. And so the idea is that those are, um, are uh, simply delays that will hold the photon there for a while. Um, now we could replace those simply with cavities, right? But I think the idea was that you know, building cavities is harder than building delay lines. Um, so, so that's the circuit we have. So now I'm going to, um, so, so what we can do is we can use the circuit and we can use the gates that I've, that I've just presented previously in, a, in the right sequence in order to do our photon loss correction. Um, so what I'm going to do is to just show you what that sequence is and it will, it will really look rather complicated. Um, but if you break it down, you find out that, you know, each, each element is, is, is actually quite understandable. It's not, it's not that complex. Um, so this is a, a, te a, a temporal sequence. So along the bottom line in the x-axis, along the x-axis is time. Just I think there's a question in the chat. If only I knew how to move the chat around. Here we go. How one bosonic code is prepared. Oh, right. Can you tell us, right, how to prepare a bosonic code in the experiment. In other words, of course, what we're doing is we're doing photon loss correction here, assuming we have the code. We do actually have to repair the code. Now, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't actually make up slides on that. Um, but, uh, but Stefan, um, in the in the paper which is on the archive, um, Stefan uh, has has a little section where he shows that the three mode cavities are. Um, are flexible enough that they can prepare the code states, um, but I'm afraid I can't actually, I can't, I can't tell you the exact sequence of operations uh, off the top of my head. Uh, but but you can you can find it in the paper. Okay, so um, so we have uh, we have this time sequence here. So what are we going to do? Well. Um, the, uh, the, the top row is cavity one, is three MP1, right? And the bottom row is the other one. So what, what we do to start with is we put one of our inputs, uh, input one into the first cavity, the B mode of the first cavity. And we put, uh, uh, and we put uh, the other, mode and another ancillary mode with a, with a single photon and into the other one. So we have, uh, so to start with, we have, uh, we have uh, one, one of the three MPs contains uh, one of our modes and an extra photon. And the other one contains one of our modes and an extra photon. Um, so actually, if you look at the bottom of this diagram, then, uh, then you get an idea of what happens in the three cases. So our three cases are there's no error or one of the modes had a photon loss or the other mode had a photon loss, right? It's basically the three. What, what will actually happen in the first case where there's no errors is that the, um, uh, the modes that contain the code actually just end up going straight through. They don't, they don't get rerouted. Um, but 
we're going to use our conditional transfer operation to reroute the, uh, the modes if they have an error and perform the error correction operation. So, uh, so now I'm going so to go into a little more detail and, and show you a correction happening, I'm going to uh, now explicitly add to the diagram um, what happens in that case. So if I can, uh, there it is. Um, so this now tells us what is actually in each cavity as it's happening. Uh, so so what, what we're assuming here is that the, uh, the top mode has yeah. lost a photon. Hang on just a second. Okay, so, um, uh, right, so, so it's lost a photon. So either, um, so in the top right, uh, top left hand corner here, uh, the state is either 0, 3, 1 or 0, 1, 1 because the, uh, the two modes will have, um, uh, sorry, that, that particular mode will either have three photons or one photon because it's lost one instead of two or four. Whereas the bottom one will have four photons or, or two photons. So now we use our conditional addition operation right here. Uh, that's the, uh, the little symbol there is the gas pump. Uh, it's called the pump gate. Stefan called it the pump gate because it pumps one photon into the other modes. Um, so, uh, so what happens then is that if there was an error and only if there was an error, the photon is transferred from the, uh, from the ancilla mode to the, uh, to the code mode. And so it now has uh, four photons or two photons in it. The photons have been replaced. But the key thing now is that the, uh, the ancillary mode has, has no photons. And so we can now use that ancillary mode as our conditional operation. Uh, because if the photon got taken out of the ancillary mode, then we know we have to do something. We have to do our correction operation. Um, because even though we've added the photon in, we still don't have the right state, the right code state. But if we didn't have to add the photon, then we don't have to do so that's really what conditions the rest of the um, of the code. So uh, the traffic light symbol here, going on to our next operation, the traffic light symbol is this conditional transfer. So we transfer the mode if and only if the auxiliary doesn't have a photon, and um, we transfer it to a different uh, to a different mode to the A mode instead of the B mode, and now that A mode gets routed to the other 3MP. So in the case that you need, you had an error correction, um, that uh, the code mode will end up being routed to the other uh, 3MP. And so both modes, both code modes will now be in one of the 3MPs. And we can now do our operation to restore the code state, which means doing that entangling operation here 0220 if uh, if we have an error. And then this gets routed back to its original uh, to its original uh, 3MP, and then it gets transferred back into the B, which then doubles the number of photons again. And so our output is the correct 0, 4, plus 4, 0 state. Anyway, so, so each of these operands is really quite simple. Uh, and you might say, well, um, OK, you, you can break it down into these operations in this way, and, and that's good. But you know, you're using a quantum control operation. So maybe you could just get your three MP to do the whole error correction in one step. Um, so, so it turns out um, that, that actually that isn't so easy, that, uh, that, that there, there is some limit to the complexity of what it's easy to get the three MP to do in one step. Um, now it, it may, it, you know, it's probably possible to get it to do the whole thing, um, you know, but, but that is, that, that's a harder operation to find, you know, the control sequence that does that. I have evolved for longer, it's going to be a more complex control sequence, it's harder to locate. So, um, so, so, this, so this is what we came up with as our, um, uh, as our, our kind of uh, best, uh, best operation. Um, so I don't think I'm over time by too much and we probably have enough time for questions. So if it's okay, um, and I'll assume it's okay if you don't interrupt me, uh, and you're welcome to interrupt me, um, I might just talk um, finally about 
you know, now that we have this design for a complete photon correction circuit, uh, what are the prospects? Like, where is technology now? And where would we have to get to in order to actually have this thing work out? Um, and, and you're going to find out as, you know, as usual that it's pretty challenging. Um, so, so right now, uh, we have uh, photonic, uh, photonic circuits, we can build them in the lab, that have you know, certain properties, certain Q factors for the cavities, certain volumes for the cavities. Remember, we want tiny cavities, as, as tiny as we can get them. And uh, we have photonic materials with a certain strength of chi 2 nonlinearity. So, uh, so what we need is we need um, to do and to be able to do enough operations within the lifetime of our cavities to make it worthwhile. So that really means um, that our our volume and our chi two have to be such that our operations are going to be fast enough. So tiny enough volume, strong enough chi two for fast enough operations compared to the uh, the decay rate out of the cavity. So we've We've coined this, uh, and we've uh, defined this this quantity n, which is how many operations can we do in a cavity lifetime. Um, so if we do if we do a simulation, numerical simulation on the code, so you know we put our code states in, and then do a simulation with with our three with our three mo cavities and with a certain cavity lifetime, then uh, then we find uh, just a minute. Uh, we need n about 2,000. So in order to get this to work, to break even, we need, uh, we need about 2,000 operations in a cavity lifetime. Okay, so uh, we need about 2,000, in about 2,000. What do we have right now? Well, if we take um, uh, you know, typical cavities at the moment, Q factor about 10 to the 7, uh, volume is about 2,000 lambda cubed, um, standard chinon linearity. Uh, we have n is about 0 0.03. Okay, so that's quite a long way away. That's about a factor of 100. My apologies, COVID-19 is you know, causing some, uh, some challenges. Okay, so, um, so that's a long way away. So where do we need to get to? We have, um, uh, we have our, uh, so, so if we assume that our Q factors only go up by about a factor of 20, that's assuming, right, that we're taking our cavities and we're miniaturizing them, right? We're getting these highly confined cavities while generally preserving the Q factor. So we want our cavities to go down by a factor of about 2 million. So we have 10 to the minus 3 lambda cubed. Now, cavities have already been built with, with this size. Uh, it's, a, it's a question of getting the Q factors back up, right? Um, I think uh, the result from IBM recently um, where they have uh, this size cavity and the Q factor is about 10 to the 5. So that's about another three orders of magnitude required. Um, and uh, chi factor, uh, chi two goes up by a little bit, then we reach 2000. So, so that tells us where we need to get to. And if we extrapolate from, uh, from the previous uh, progress of the last decade uh, that, I, that I showed previously, um, then it's about 10 years away. Okay, well that, that wraps up what I wanted to say. So please, um, uh, please ask questions if you wish.